What you can enjoy tonight is five mini messages from five people who are part of the Road to Life Church family and to hear a little bit about what God's doing in their life. And I just really wholeheartedly believe that it's going to be significant for different ones of you uh, to really lean in. I just wholeheartedly believe that there are words tonight that are going to minister uh, to different hearts. So I just want to encourage you, if you're tuning in, um, there's so many different ways that God could be influencing your life tonight. And we're just so stoked that you chose midweek. So I'm going to pray so I don't steal any time from these guys because they've been working hard and I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Jesus, we love you and we just thank you for who you are. And I'm just so wholeheartedly uh, believing for just significance tonight that you would be teaching all of us through these stories, through these testimonies, through these words. We just trust you for a powerful evening in Jesus mighty name. Amen. What's up, guys? My name is Ben. I want to talk to you guys for just a few minutes about your identity in Christ. So I'm going to read Ephesians 4, verses 22 to 24. It says, Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Now, what I want you to notice about this scripture specifically is it doesn't say just put on the new nature that God gives you. It says take off the old nature and then put on the new nature. Now, I think that's very important, especially in today's culture, because today's culture says, I don't want to see your problems. You just cover them up. It kind of has this fake it till you make it mentality, right? Where it says you better know everybody. You better know everything. You better make all the money. You better have all the friends. And if you don't pretend like you do. Because as soon as you don't, people know that you're weak, and that's a bad thing in the eyes of culture, right? And so I think of it like this. Let's say you got this brand new coat, okay? It's a really nice looking coat. You're looking good in it. The inside is so soft. And so you put it on, you button it up. And as you're walking around, people are like, man, I just love that coat. You look so good. That looks awesome. And you're like, yeah, I feel good. I'm looking good. But the problem is when you put it on, you were already wearing a burlap sack, okay? And it was itchy, and it was pointy, and it was sharp. And instead of taking that off before you put on the jacket, you said, "Uh, I'll just cover it. That's fine. And as you're walking around, you're looking good on the outside, but on the inside, you are scratching and you are itching and it is driving you crazy. And eventually it gets to the point where you have to take off the jacket. And everyone sees you and says, why is that dude wearing a burlap sack? Why is he all scratched up? Why is he so messed up? Why is he going through all that? I thought he was the cool guy in the jacket. Turns out he's just this guy all messed up by this burlap sack. And that's weird, right? And that's what we do a lot of the times. We try to put on and say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm this good Christian person. I don't have any problems. I don't have any issues, right? I mean, think about the phrase, I love Jesus, but. No one says that. They don't say, I love Jesus, but I'm addicted to porn. They don't say, I love Jesus, but I'm depressed. Like those kind of things, people don't say that because they're afraid what people will think. They think, oh, I have to be this good, upstanding Christian all the time doing all these things. And I can't let people know that I'm hurting and I'm weak. See, we don't like to be exposed. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, when they ate the fruit from the tree, the first thing they noticed was that they were naked. And they immediately went and made clothes to cover themselves because they were so ashamed. We don't like to be exposed. We don't like to be found out. We don't like to be honest and say, actually, I'm kind of messed up inside. I love Jesus, but I'm kind of hurting. But really, that's what the gospel is all about. It's about us going to Jesus and saying, look, Jesus, I have all this stuff. I did this bad thing. I'm hurt by this. I have these pains and these these scratches. And Jesus says, I know. And I love you and I forgive you. And you're going to spend eternity with me. But I think the part we oftentimes miss is that Jesus says, heaven doesn't have to start when you die and go to heaven. It can start now. I want to walk with you through these struggles, through these pains, I want to make you stronger. I want to make you better. I want to make you able to overcome these things so you can help other people overcome them too. See, because when we do that, we're better here. But it takes a moment of being honest and being authentic and saying, look, I do struggle with this. I am hurt by this. And Jesus says, okay, let me walk with you. Let me help you through this. Because honestly, guys, a fake identity is absolutely exhausting. Because you're always trying to justify yourself. You're always trying to prove yourself. And eventually, it's just going to fall apart. But an authentic identity. When you walk in that, when you walk in that power and that honesty, you can say, look, I'm not perfect, but I'm getting better. I'm not perfect, but Jesus is here with me, helping me through it all the way. 
And so that's what I want for you guys to think about today. Is there any area of your life where you are just trying to cover it up and like act like you have it all together that you need to expose a little bit and say, look, God, here it is. I'm willing to be naked before you because I know that you'll help me get rid of this. You'll help me work through it. And you will get me up to that place of really being able to wear your new identity. And so I just want to pray that over you guys before we go to the next speaker. So dear Lord, just thank you so much that you've given us this new identity. God, thank you that you want to help us work through our old stuff so we can walk out in the full power and full authority and full peace and full joy and full everything that you have for us, God. Lord, help us to be authentic. Help us to be real. Help us to be honest with what you have. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So good. So tonight, for just a few minutes, I want to share with you a personal encounter I had with the Holy Spirit about a month ago that has really led me to have depth and just trust in the Father when in certain situations of uncertainty or fear or confusion. So about a month ago, there was this week where I was having these terrible nightmares, and they were those kind of nightmares where they were crippling, if you know what I mean, if you've ever experienced them, where you don't want to get out of bed, you don't want to open your eyes, but you also don't want to close your eyes, you're super terrified and afraid. And so I was having these nightmares, and every night I would wake up, and I'd be so fearful, and the voice of the enemy, it sounded so loud at the moment, and honestly, the voice of God felt really faint, but I knew that I had to choose a father, and so my prayers in those moments were not perfect. They were more like, God, I need help. God, I am so scared. God, I need rest. God, I need you. God, I need you. God, I need you. And these were my prayers for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, however long it took. And eventually, in the midst of my prayers, I'd eventually fall back asleep. And so with these nightmares going on for a few nights, there was a morning, and I was just anticipating the night that was to come because, honestly, I was scared that I was going to have a nightmare again. And this morning, the morning that um, I prayed, I was like, God, why am I having these dreams? Did I do something wrong? Are you punishing me? Am I afraid of something in this world? Like, why am I experiencing these things? And I was becoming frustrated and angry because I just wanted to sleep and to rest. And in this moment, I felt the Father simply respond, refocus your attention. Are you more focused on the dreams you're having or the intimacy with me in those moments? And when the Holy Spirit revealed this, I felt so loved and so free because I realized in this moment where I felt so alone and so scared, the Father was actually so close. He was so near. He was protecting me. He was giving me rest and he was giving me dependency on him. And so from this place, I began to refocus my thoughts and my attention from what the devil was trying to do through me and over me or to me from what God was doing in me and for me. And so the fear no longer had all the attention. The Father did. And it was a really freeing thing. And since that moment, I've stepped into greater depth with the Father. I've stepped into greater prayer, a greater prayer life with Him, greater dependency on Him, all from these nightmares. And I want to share a verse with you guys today. John 10.10, 10, it says this. This is the Passion Translation. A thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. This is the truth about the, the enemy. He wants to ke kill, steal, slaughter, destroy your rest, your joy, your marriage, your finances, your stability. He wants to destroy that. And he wants us to become d distracted and not stand on the truth that God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit has come to give us an abundant life that overflows. And so when you're being attacked, just know the enemy's tactic is to kill and destroy and to steal every good thing from your life. And when we refocus our eyes to the truth of the Father, it's like he's come to give abundant life. 
And so tonight, if I can leave you applying anything that I've said, let it be that in the midst of uncertainty, press into the Father. Allow him to reveal how close he is. Allow him to reveal how much he cares for you. Your prayers do not have to be perfect. They don't have to have a deep understanding of the Bible. You don't have to say all the right words. But when it's just a heart posture of Jesus, I am lost without you and I just need you. Let that be your prayer. Just choose to make Jesus the center of your attention. Don't focus on what the enemy is trying to do to you, but what the Father is trying to do through you. And so just to close in um, my part, I just want to pray over you guys tonight. And as I pray, um, if you're in your house, you're in your car, um, just open your hands and just receive this prayer. But Father, I thank you that in you we have abundant life. I thank you that you hear our hearts cries and you are leaning in to listen and to mend. Lord, help us keep our attention on you. I declare blessing over every person that hears my voice, God. May you pour out your Holy Spirit on them. Show them how near you are. May their ears be more tuned to you than any other. I thank you that by your power we are victorious. In Jesus' name, amen. What's up, Road to Life Church? Parker McLean here. You guys have probably seen me up there playing the drums before. Uh, I just want to talk to you guys tonight a little bit about pain tolerance. Uh, this is something that I and a few other guys at this church know about because we've all been uh, rolling jujitsu for a while together. I've been doing mixed martial arts for about uh, five years now. Started doing it when I was young for a few years. Gym I was fighting and closed down, then picked up probably about five years ago again. But one of the biggest things in fighting you have to learn is you have to have a pain tolerance. Uh, I have a fractured bone in my hand right now. I've broken all my fingers and toes, broken my nose multiple times, and I've torn two tendons. So it kind of comes with the territory if you want to fight. Um, and I remember it was funny though, like when you first start fighting, uh, when you're brand new to it, when you've never done it before. Uh, it's really funny, like, I just remember being this cocky young kid and I just want to do it and I want to be a fighter and all these things. Until one day, I remember going, I finally started doing it and I went through this lesson and I was learning some moves, learning how to throw a punch, learning how to do a double leg takedown, all these different things. And I thought it was sweet, I got all cocky, thought I was going to murder some people. And then I remember the first time I sparred and someone picked me up and double legged me and slammed me on my back. And it completely knocked the wind out of me and I was like, this is not fun. It sucks. And very quickly, I realized to be a good fighter, you have to develop some sort of pain tolerance. You have to learn um, to fight through it. You can't just uh, tap because of pressure or let's, you know, just quit because you're, you're hurt. You have to keep fighting through it to uh, either succeed or if it's a real-life scenario. Um, and it's funny now, I've been able to develop that pain tolerance to where uh, when I've gotten hurt, I can keep fighting, I can keep rolling rounds, different things like that. But um, just recently, it's funny, I was just reminded of that time in my life by some new people who have been coming and rolling with us and sparring with us and stuff. And I can see, you know, like just seeing some of these guys get hit in the face for the first time, seeing some of these guys get taken down for the first time, and just seeing that reaction um, in them. And I can really tell that while wow, these guys don't have a pain tolerance, while that guy hasn't been hit before. And it reminds me of back where I was uh, when I first started out. But a lot of times I feel like this can be, uh, that kind of can be our walk with the Lord, that can be our walk uh, in Christianity. Uh, Mike has said something really good this past weekend um, about how when you first become a Christian, you're almost in this enlightenment stage. You're kind of at this stage where the Lord's taking care of you. You're constantly encountering the Lord. You're kind of on this spiritual high, and you're, you're getting close, and you're like, wow, this is awesome. Until some bad things might start happening again. Maybe temptation starts creeping back in uh, from your old life. Maybe someone you know passes away. Maybe there's sickness in your family. Could be, could be anything. And those can be really hard things to go through and it can be kind of tough as you're coming to know the Lord be like God why is this happening in, happening to me and you can kind of almost realize I kind of feel like you're losing control or you don't have control of the things around you but I just want to assure you today that God has control of everything going on even when you make a mistake even when you sin God still has control over the circumstances in your life um, Romans 8 28 says and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. So right there, that shows that no matter what's going on in your life, God is always working things out for your good. Now, I will say, it does not say that all things are good. Being a Christian isn't guaranteed that life is going to be easy, that everything's always going to go your way, everything's just going to be awesome, whoa, Jesus. 
Things are gonna be tough in life, but as you build your faith, as you keep running towards Jesus, I promise you he's gonna build that tolerance, that pain tolerance. You're gonna be able to go through harder things. You're gonna learn things. You're gonna start to find lessons in the hard things. And I promise you that as you keep running into Jesus, he's gonna build that pain tolerance for you. So I just wanna pray that over you guys right now. Father, I just pray for uh, everyone just watching this. I just pray that you would build that pain tolerance. God, I just love that verse that you are always building things good for us, Father. You are always there for us. You see everything we go through. And I just ask that you would just encourage the people watching this, God, that you are there for them, that you are working good in their lives, even if things might not look good right now, and even if they're going through a lot of pain right now, God, that you are still there for them and that your, your hand has reached out to them this entire time. So we just thank you for this, and we just ask that you would just show that to them, and we just pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. What's up, Road to Life? My name's Anna Maria. With my five minutes, I want to share two thoughts of what I'm calling the beauty of the ordinary life. So this past October, I got married to my wonderful husband, Parker, who was just up here speaking. And more than ever, I really felt the weight of the ordinary, doing the same things over and over just to do the same things over and over. And I think as a society, it's very easy to look at our lives and see them through the lens of, well, ordinary, maybe even sometimes insignificant or unimportant. And these two thoughts that I'm sharing tonight have brought a lot of comfort, a lot of purpose, and fresh perspective to me, and I hope that they do the same for you. So thought number one, it's incredibly easy to overlook the fact that God created human life, or what I'm going to call real life. In fact, what I love about God is that not only did he create real life, but he also lived real life. John 1.14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's talking about Jesus coming to earth, fully man, fully God, and living real life. Jesus, the one who is worthy of all worship, all glory, all fanfare, spent decades in ordinariness. Jesus spent his days quietly. Jesus went to work. Jesus got sleepy. Jesus woke up with morning breath. Jesus went to the bathroom. He lived a, he lived a pedestrian life among average people. And going even a little deeper, before Jesus started in his three years of ministry, before he ever did anything extraordinary or impressive, before he healed, before he cast out demons, before he had been crucified or resurrected, while he was still living a very average life, there was a moment when God spoke from heaven during Jesus' baptism and said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. That shows us that Jesus was deeply loved by God, even in his ordinariness. And because we are baptized and one with Christ, the same is true for us. In our ordinary, average, and very mundane lives, we are loved and we are known by God. Thought number two, I want to dismantle this idea that there is any part of our lives that are untouched, unseen, or disconnected from God. It's very easy to miss God in the grind of the everyday life, in the grind of the everyday life, if we're being honest. So, uh, so often, I think we separate our regular lives and our spiritual lives. Kind of like, you know, yeah, yeah, God, I know what your Bible says, but I've got dishes to do. I've got dinner to be made. I've got homework projects. The kids are crying. Fill in the blank. But I want to encourage you, if you take a moment to slow down and look closely, God is wanting to show you that our ordinary life and our spirituality in God actually go hand in hand. There's a quote from an author named Tish Harrison Warren from a book that she wrote called Liturgy of the Ordinary. And her quote says this, Daily life, dishes in the sink, children that ask the same questions and want the same stories again and again, the long doldrum, doldrums of the afternoon, these things are filled with repetition, and much of the Christian life is returning over and over to the same work and the same habits of worship. We must contend with the same spiritual struggles again and again. The work of repentance and faith is daily and repetitive. Again and again we repent, again and again we believe. Through our daily life, God is simultaneously teaching us how to handle our spiritual lives. Just like the dishes that need to be done, our spiritual lives require daily work. 
And as we tend to our spiritual needs, slowly, one day at a time, we learn, we grow, we develop into the person that God has always intended for us to be. So I want to encourage us not to be defeated when once again we have to face that mountain of dishes or that same spiritual battle, but to remember that it's all a part of this very real life that God created. That's all I have tonight. I want to pray over us before we move on to the next speaker. So God, I just thank you that you're so relatable and you're so real. Thank you, Jesus, for the ordinary and how you use it in our lives, God. I just pray over everyone watching tonight, God, open our eyes to show us how you're teaching us, how you're growing us through the ordinary and through the mundane moments of our lives. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, what is up, Road to Life Church? Uh, my name is Justin Burrell. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, which is probably a lot of you, uh, my wife and I just recently moved here from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, so to answer some questions you probably already have, uh, no, I am not a U of M fan. Yes, I am a fan of the Ohio State Buckeyes. No, I am not a fan of Notre Dame. Yes, I am a fan of the Ohio State Buckeyes. I will repeat. Um, all I'm saying is if you do have a problem, dearest apologies, but like, look who got Got at the championship game last year. Um, anyways, enough of all that. I'm not here to tell you why OSU is the superior football team, because they are. Um, I'm here to talk about the Word of God, so let's get spiritual in the house tonight. So uh, I'm going to be reading out of Matthew chapter 26, and it'll be verses 20 through 25. And it says, when it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve, and as they were eating, he said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? And he answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but to uh, woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? And he said to him, You have said so. So this scene is set just before the crucifixion of Jesus, and we see him here having one final meal, one last meal with his disciples, the 12 men whom have followed him for just over three and a half years of ministry. And during this meal, Jesus sees fit to share some information with his disciples. And the information he shared is that one of them who is at that very table will go on to betray him. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, this packed a little bit of shell shock for his disciples who no doubt have grown very devoted to him after seeing him perform miracle after miracle and after uh, hearing him claim to be the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Messiah for whom they have waited so long. Now, as they go down the line, they all repeat this same question, is it I, Lord? However, we get to this one man, and this man's name is Judas, and we see the question change ever so slightly, but at quite a costly consequence. Judas changes the question from, is it I, Lord, to, is it I, Rabbi? Now, many of us would like to be able to point fingers at Judas and uh, really question him because of his betrayal toward Jesus. I mean, how could someone who has followed Jesus for so long, how could someone who has no doubt seen the mighty miracle working hand of God, how could someone betray Jesus for something as trivial and pointless and worthless as money? However, I do believe that answer is found in the exchange of the word Lord for the word rabbi, which simply just means teacher. Not only does that small change of a singular word point out a flaw in the character of Judas, but I believe it points out to us tonight a flaw and a shortcoming in many of our relationships with God. Because if we're being honest, as much as we may like to point fingers and, and rag on Judas, we have all been in his shoes. We have all given up uh, deeper intimacy and relationship with Jesus for something that seems trivial, for something that seems worthless when compared to the beauty and the majesty and the holiness of such a great God. We have done this by simply looking at Jesus as someone from whom we can gain knowledge on how to live a good life rather than making him Lord so he can give us a set apart life. Unfortunately, much of modern day Christianity has forgotten what lordship looks like because we have used grace as an excuse to sin rather than a motivation to live more like Jesus. 
Grace has not been and never will be an excuse to forego uh, forego consecration, which is a big fancy church word that simply means to be different and to be set apart. We are still called to be separate. We are still called to be different, and we are still called to make a difference. Biblical obedience, biblical lordship will not cause our list of convictions to get shorter, but it will actually cause it to get longer because we will realize in light of how great he is, in light of how good he is, anything and everything is worth giving up to get more of his presence and more of his anointing in our life. Now, I'm not here tonight to try to come across like I'm trying to condemn you and say that there isn't mercy or grace for those of us who may have fallen short. In fact, there's a verse in Romans chapter 3 verses 23 through 24 that tells us the opposite. It says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but it goes on to say that we're justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. However, I want to come and challenge us tonight to seek after God, not just seek after his grace, not just to forgive our sins, but to transform us from the inside out. So tonight, I want us to pray that God would search our heart and show us what we need to trim out and cut out of our lives. I'm going to pray this scripture. It's out of Psalm 139. It's verses 23 and 24. And it says this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of the everlasting. Lord, I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. of life we're all walking in and there's different things that motivate us but at the end of the day God calls us all his children um, and is causing us to grow and know him more and tonight whether it was a greater understanding of the importance of having your identity rooted in God um, knowing that you need friends that you can turn to and be vulnerable with that can hold you accountable if you're here and you needed encouragement because you're in the middle of watching the kids and washing dishes and you needed to be reminded of the the beauty of an ordinary life or maybe this was an opportunity tonight where God was just calling you close and say, I just, I so deeply want to be the Lord of your life. And he's just maybe nudging you in an, in an area where he's wanting to give you more victory and more um, freedom. I just want to encourage you to not just let that end tonight. I so wholeheartedly believe that God is nudging all all of our hearts in an area this evening in response to one of these messages. And our hope and our prayer tonight is that it wouldn't be something that you just hear and move on, but that it would take root in your life, that it would create depth and intimacy, that there would be an actionable step for you. Um, If you're someone tonight who needs prayer, maybe you've heard something and you're not sure you have someone you can turn to, we want to encourage you that you can text us at 269-924-0909. We'd love to pray for you. Um, And of course, we'd love to invite all of you to our Sunday services. We'll be here on Sunday um, at 8.30, 10, and 11.30 a.m. And at the end of every service, uh, we invite people up to receive prayer if that's something you're interested in. And equally, if you are not attending church in person right now, we totally understand. You can watch us live on Sunday at 10 a.m. or you can meet us here next week for Live at the Ivy at 7 p.m. But we just so appreciate the time you took on your Thursday night to grow and to know God more deeply. We're so encouraged. We love you, church, and we'll see you next time.